The student went for an interview and disappeared without a trace. The next morning, her body was found in a field, and the police began searching for those responsible. From the first days of the investigation, there were many confusing moments and unexpected twists. But in the end, the truth was revealed. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Megan Sharpton. Megan Sharpton was born on October 24, 1987, in the small American town of Tullahoma, Tennessee. She grew up in a large and friendly family with two sisters and a brother with whom she got along very well. Her parents tried to give maximum attention to all their children, but Megan was closest to her mother. From an early age, the young woman helped her parents take care of her younger siblings. She also always tried to help her friends and loved ones. In her school years, Megan decided she wanted to become a nurse, so she enrolled in the local Motlow College, which was 10 kilometers from her home. The young woman also got a job as a waitress in a local restaurant and eventually moved in with her boyfriend, Chris. In the summer of 2012, when Megan was 24 years old, she had only a few months left before finishing college. After that, she planned to immediately find a job as a nurse. Shortly before this, she also got a job at a nursing home to gain practical skills in helping the elderly. Despite such an intense rhythm of life, Megan tried to see her family whenever possible. On July 1st, her sister, who lived in another city, came home and Megan promised to meet with her. However, that evening, the young woman called her mother and said that she would be delayed. She was offered an interesting job opportunity and Megan agreed to an interview that same evening. She was happy for this opportunity and promised her mother to come as soon as the interview was over. According to her, the job involved taking care of an elderly woman. However, time passed and there was no news from Megan. She did not respond to messages or calls. Her parents began to worry. They contacted her boyfriend, but he also did not know where Megan was and was not even aware of the interview. Despite this, the parents decided not to panic and wait for their daughter to get in touch. She was already 24 years old and with her busy schedule, between studying and two jobs, the young woman could simply be busy. But the next day, Megan still did not show up. Meanwhile, in a remote area several kilometers from the city, at around 1.30 a.m., a group of teenagers noticed a fire in a field. It was a hot summer, so they thought that the forest fires had spread to the grass. They immediately called the firefighters who arrived at the scene. However, an unexpected turn of events awaited them. Soon after the firefighters began extinguishing the flames, they saw a body laying in the center of the fire. When the fire was completely extinguished and the police arrived at the scene, they realized that a dead young woman lay before them. They immediately understood that a murder had been committed. However, the detectives could not establish the identity of the deceased. She had no documents, wallet, or phone with her, and due to the fire's effects, she could not be identified. The only thing that the detectives could grasp was two small star-shaped tattoos. The detectives studied the crime scene and concluded that the young woman was already dead before the fire started. This was evidenced by a serious head injury, which apparently was fatal, but they could not find any traces of the killer's presence. The victim was partially undressed, but from her t-shirt, the police concluded that she worked as a nurse. They also determined that they had not received any reports of missing persons related to this young woman, which also complicated establishing her identity. However, soon after the information spread throughout the small town, her mother saw a post on social media about a young woman with two star-shaped tattoos being found in the field at night and realized with horror that her daughter was the victim. Medical experts ultimately confirmed that she was indeed Megan Sharpton. They also found that the cause of death was a gunshot wound to the back of the head, confirming the police version that the young woman was already dead at the time of the fire. 
Moreover, she was killed in another location and then taken to that field. In addition, she was subjected to violence before her death and the experts were able to extract a DNA sample from the perpetrator. It was immediately run through the database, but there were no matches. First, the detectives began searching for Megan's car, a red Mustang. She had been working at a restaurant that evening and left in her car, but it was nowhere to be found. This indicated that the killer most likely drove it somewhere where they could find substantial evidence. However, its location remained unknown and the police started searching for potential suspects among Megan's acquaintances. Their first focus was on her boyfriend, Chris, and the detectives had a significant reason to investigate him. Megan's sister immediately told them that she suspected Chris's involvement in the murder because there had been problems in their relationship. Megan had been dating Chris for three years, some of which they had lived together. They shared an apartment with another roommate, and the police spoke with Chris, who denied any involvement in the crime. At first, he claimed that everything was fine between him and Megan, but eventually admitted that their relationship had been struggling lately, and they were heading for a breakup. He insisted, however, that he had no motive for the murder and had a solid alibi at the time of her death. While the police checked his alibi, they decided to search the apartment where Megan and Chris lived. In the bathroom, they found the first alarming clue, blood stains and needles containing illegal substances. At the same time, 20 kilometers outside the city, detectives found her car. It had been abandoned in a remote, deserted location. Inside, there were no documents or phones, which meant that the perpetrator might have taken or thrown them away elsewhere. The police reached out to the public, asking people to report anything similar they might find. Additionally, there was no signs of struggle or blood in the car, but they found something interesting. A note with an address that didn't exist. The detectives concluded that the unknown criminal had used this address to lure Megan to a deserted place to commit the crime. From the first hours of the investigation, detectives learned that the evening of the crime, Megan was supposed to go for an interview, but they had absolutely no leads in that direction. They believed that the non-existent address was given to her by the person who offered her the job. When the public learned the details of the case, many drew a chilling parallel. Six months ago, another young woman of roughly the same age as Megan, who was also studying to become a nurse, disappeared without a trace several hundred kilometers from Tahoma. What was even more terrifying was that this coincidence led everyone to believe that a serial killer was at work in the area, fueling the atmosphere of fear that the perpetrator would strike again. Meanwhile, the police questioned the couple's neighbor, who admitted to taking illegal substances. The neighbor claimed that Megan and Chris did not know about this and never indulged in it themselves. Experts analyzed the bloodstains and concluded that they did indeed belong to the neighbor. But his story didn't end there. He claimed that Megan and Chris had actually broken up a long time ago and he had started seeing her recently. The neighbor also insisted that he had been hiding his addiction from her. With this information, the police began to suspect both Chris and the neighbor. Chris could have held a grudge against Megan, and the neighbor had a penchant for illegal substances, but there was no evidence against them. During his interrogation, Chris stated that he didn't know about their relationship, and by that time, the police had already verified his alibi. At the time of Megan's murder, he was indeed at work, so they ruled him out as a suspect. As for the neighbor, he didn't have a solid alibi, but analyzing his phone records revealed that he had been trying to call and message Megan all night in an attempt to find out where she had gone. Although this was not substantial evidence of his innocence, the police doubted that he was the killer. Both of the guys had their DNA samples taken and sent to the lab, but the results could take months to come back. Meanwhile, the detectives had a new lead. Chris had offered to help with the investigation during his last interrogation. 
On the day of Megan's disappearance, a man hand called her old phone, which was at home, and said he wanted to talk to her about a caregiver job and that Naomi had recommended her. Chris added that Megan had mentioned a young woman with that name who went to college with her, but he didn't know any details. So the police started looking for her among Motlow's students and soon found her. She was the only student with that name and the detectives got her address, but she wasn't home. They talked to her neighbors and one of them gave them Naomi's phone number. She was surprised by the police call and said she barely knew Megan. They had a few classes together but didn't talk much and she never recommended her for a job. In fact, she added that Megan annoyed her, so she wouldn't have helped her. The police were disappointed that this promising lead didn't lead anywhere, but they still had something more substantial. Chris gave them the phone on which the job call had come in, and the detectives had the caller's number. Experts determined that the call was made from a prepaid phone, so it was impossible to identify the owner's name. But the police traced the device to the store where it was sold, and there was a surveillance camera at the checkout. By studying the footage on the day of the phone purchase, they immediately saw the buyer. From these shots, the police immediately realized that he was buying the phone for some illegal purposes. Prepaid phones in America are in demand among those involved in criminal cases, as they do not need to provide their data to use them. And this person on the recording, at some point, took out his own phone from his pocket, indicating that he was buying an additional one for some questionable purposes. There was also a camera in the store pointing at the parking lot. The police saw the buyer leave the building and get into his car, which soon led to the identification of his identity. It turned out to be Timothy Gifford, who had an impressive criminal history. However, the man only engaged in petty trade of illegal substances and was not involved in anything serious. He was soon tracked down and taken to the police station. He claimed that he had purchased the phone not for himself, but for his acquaintance, a 37-year-old man named Donnie Jones. He said that Donnie was going to have an operation and he himself would not be able to go for the phone. As payment for this service, Donnie gave Timothy several illegal pills. Detectives were familiar with this man. He also had an impressive criminal history, but often acted as a police informant. Despite this, no connection between Donnie and Megan was traced until Timothy revealed something else. Donnie wrote to him that he wanted to exchange his pickup truck for a Mustang and asked for help with this. Timothy considered this request quite strange as Donnie had two small children and the Mustang was far from the most convenient family car. However, he agreed to try to find a client. Donnie handed him the pickup truck and he noticed that there was brand new carpets and seat covers in the interior of the rather old car. Donnie explained this by saying that his wife had told him that the chances of selling the car with a refreshed interior were much higher. And here, the police suddenly discovered something that shocked them and glued all these parts of the store together. Donnie Frank turned out to be the husband of Naomi, who supposedly recommended the job to Megan. At this point, the detectives realized that they were getting close to solving the case. Unfortunately for them, the man's DNA sample was not in the database, as he had not been charged with violent crimes. They immediately went to Donnie and Naomi's house to talk to them. At first, the man claimed that he was not familiar with Megan, but within a few minutes, he said that he had given her and Naomi a ride to college a few times. This seemed strange against the backdrop of Naomi's testimony a few weeks earlier. Then she claimed that she barely knew Megan and they hardly spoke and did not get along in general. However, during the subsequent conversation, the woman did say that her husband had indeed given them a ride once. However, Donnie firmly insisted on his innocence. According to his words, on the evening of the murder, he was at home with his children. He allowed the police to search his house 
without a warrant and voluntarily provided his DNA sample. In addition, he denied asking Timothy to buy a prepaid phone for him. The police found no evidence in his house and they had to wait for the DNA test results, which could also take months. Two months had passed since the murder. Megan's parents received her nursing degree and the event was dedicated to her memory. People hoped that the police would catch the ruthless monster who could kill someone else at any moment. Eventually, the lab results showed a complete match between Donnie's DNA sample and the one found in Megan's body. He was immediately brought to the station, but he continued to insist on his innocence. Upon learning about the DNA match, he changed his story and told the detectives that he had a secret affair with Megan, which he did not tell his wife about. This was supposedly the reason why he did not reveal this information initially. The police considered his story an obvious fabrication, but they had to release him. Besides DNA, they had no other connecting evidence, and finding a 100% refutation of Donnie's words was simply impossible. Thus, the detectives were almost certain that Donnie was the killer, but they needed more evidence. Although they could not charge him with murder, they still managed to arrest him. During a search of his car, they found a firearm that he was not allowed to possess due to his criminal record. While he was in custody, the police had time to search for additional evidence. They did not have to worry about Donnie attacking someone else or running away. Soon, experts determined that Megan was shot with a firearm of the same caliber as Donnie's rifle. Detectives obtained a warrant to track his phone to see his movements on the evening of Megan's murder. They compared this data with the movements of the prepaid phone that Donnie allegedly never owned, and here the police waited for a long-awaited breakthrough. On the evening of July 1st, the prepaid phone was next to Donnie's phone and was moving along the same route. Detectives identified several key locations. Megan's presumed abduction site, the location where she was killed, and the field where her body was found. Both phones were found together at all these points. Donnie's family owned several farms in the Tullahoma area, and according to the investigation, he brought Megan to one of them after kidnapping her, where he assaulted and killed her. Detectives obtained a search warrant and found a significant piece of evidence a partially burned scarf that belonged to Megan, which was a gift from her sister. This evidence, combined with Megan's belongings and DNA found at the scene, was sufficient to send the case to trial. On November 5th, Donnie was charged with murder. During the trial, new details emerged that only strengthened the case against Donnie. Experts examined his phone and discovered that he had repeatedly contacted other young women, offering them jobs as caretakers for elderly people. But all of these attempts were unsuccessful. According to the investigation, Donnie found Megan's phone number on his wife's contact list, contacted her, and said that Naomi had recommended her for the caretaking job. She agreed and he gave her a fake address, luring her to a remote location. There, he attacked her, took her to the farm, where he assaulted and killed her. He then took her body to a field and set it on fire. The final touch was a complete replacement of the floor mats and seat covers in his pickup truck, which he used to transport her body. Apparently, he was afraid that some blood stains might be difficult to clean and the police would be able to detect them. As for Naomi, the police concluded that she had nothing to do with the murder and had no knowledge of it. She was at work that night, which was confirmed by numerous pieces of evidence. During the trial, Donnie claimed his innocence and everyone was preparing for a potentially lengthy process. However, when he realized that the prosecution was seeking the death penalty, he decided to make a deal with the investigation. He would admit guilt in exchange for avoiding the death penalty. He pleaded guilty to the murder of Megan and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. However, he later claimed that he had only made the deal under pressure and demanded a retrial. When the judge granted his request, the man quickly returned to his original decision to plead guilty 
as the death penalty was back on the table during the retrial. During the court proceedings, it was also explained why the criminal voluntarily provided detectives with his DNA sample without any doubt. Apparently, he hoped that the fire would destroy all traces and the police would simply have nothing to compare a sample to. But he was wrong. Despite this, investigators concluded that Donnie was highly unlikely to be involved in the disappearance of another student who disappeared six months before Megan. More suitable suspects appeared in that case and Donnie's candidacy was no longer considered. After the verdict was announced, Megan's sister stated that the criminal would have continued to hunt young women and could have taken many more lives, but Megan stopped him with her own life. And finally, what makes the story even sadder is that in November 2013, Megan's mother, who had been doing everything in her power to help the police catch her daughter's killer, passed away. She could not cope with the devastating trauma inflicted on her by one cold-blooded criminal. Looking at Donnie's biography, it becomes clear that he could have been stopped much earlier. Among his many convictions was the charge of kidnapping a young woman, but that time he managed to escape punishment, and the criminal remained free. Who knows, maybe Megan wasn't his first victim, but the police still don't know about it. Share your thoughts on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.